So at the end of July 1914, Austria and Serbia were officially at war. Um, the big question, of course, now was what would be the response of the other major powers, uh, the Germans in responding to their Austrian allies and the Russians in responding in particular to their Serbian allies. I mean, the cartoon uh, image here kind of gives you an idea of, of essentially what happens, that as one power turns on, on the other power, it then drags in their allies into, into until all the powers of Europe have been pulled into this war. Um, so after being humiliated uh, by failing to support Serbia, uh, against Austria when Austria insisted on creating Albania in 1913, having similarly kind of allowed Serbia or having allowed Austria to seize Bosnia and not supporting the Serbs in 1908. The Russian public in particular, but even the Russian government, was very determined this time to support Serbia. Uh, so once Austria declared war on Serbia, it was inevitable that some Russian military support would be uh, provided for the Serbians. Um, now, of course, the Serbians were also aware that Austria was allied with Germany. The Serbians, the Russians, excuse me, did not want to go to war with Germany. Uh, they hoped to keep this war kind of confined between Austria and Russia exclusively, albeit that was somewhat of a, of a forlorn hope given the close relationship between Austria and Germany. Uh, but as a kind of show of their interest in only declaring war on Austria, uh, the Russian army began mobilizing on July 30th, but it only mobilized along the Austrian border. It did not mobilize along the border with Germany, and the Russians were doing this to send a signal to the Germans that you know we do not want to fight a war with you. At the same time, they were trying to get a sense from both the French and the British about what the response of, of, their, of their respective response would be in the case of a war. France and certainly the United Kingdom in particular, were very eager to avoid war. However, France also understood that, um, it was of the belief that some war with Germany in the future was inevitable. Indeed, from the French point of view, some war with Germany at some stage was actually desirable in order to uh, try and retake the, pro the lost provinces of Alsace-Lorraine. Um, and therefore, the French were much more willing to um, essentially support the Russians to follow through on the military commitment they made to the Russians in 1894 and basically said that yes if Germany attacks you and that was the, the, the caveat if Germany attacks Russia uh, we will help you and go to war um, with uh, Germany as well. The United Kingdom on the other hand um, was very equivocal in its responses and would not formally commit to any kind of um, support, formal support for France and Russia. And there has been some argument, historians kind of debate this, but had the United Kingdom been kind of much clearer that it would support France and Russia in a war with Germany, that might have forced Germany to uh, pull back on its support from Austria, which might have forced Austria to pull back on its attack on Serbia. In the United Kingdom tried to call an international conference, a peace conference, to try and resolve the tensions in the Balkans Peninsula, because obviously by this stage, in, in, in at the, at August, early August 1914, it's obvious that a, a, a war, a potential war between uh, the major powers of Europe uh, is on the cusp of breaking out. So the British proposed an international conference, but the Austrians bolstered by the confidence that the Germans had given them that they would support them, reject the call for an international conference. And this is where German strategic thinking begins to take charge. The Germans want to support the Austrians in defending, firstly, you know, avenging the death of Franz Ferdinand, in defending their empire against uh, unrestrained uh, Slavic nationalism. Um, they believed that war was now inevitable. Um, and now that war was inevitable in German minds, that essentially forced them to, and I'll, I'll say more in a second, initiate their own plan for how to deal with a war, a likely war against France and Russia. And essentially, it encouraged Germany to start thinking of launching a, launching a preemptive strike. In other words, if we are going to have to fight France and Russia anyway, why should we sit around and wait for them to attack us? Maybe it's now time for us to attack them. Um, so... As the Russians and Austrians mobilize um, in, in gearing up for war for one another, the Germans realized they would have to take some kind of military action as well, that there was simply no pulling back from this now. Um, and the thinking amongst the German government and military commanders was, if war was going to be fought, it should be fought on our terms. The Germans had actually been planning for quite some time about what to do in the case of a war, if war broke out involving Russia and France attacking Germany. And this was known as the Schleifen Plan, named after the German general von Schleifen, who had put this together in 1906. So the Schleifen Plan is actually pretty simple in its thinking. Um, the basic idea was that 
how could Germany fight a two-front war against France and Russia? The Germans calculated, Schleifen calculated, that the French and German armies, because they were both modern industrialized countries, they would take two weeks to mobilize their army. So in the case of war breaking out, it would take two weeks for the French and Germans to mobilize their armies, roughly the same length of time. But they calculated that the Russians, because it was more of a backward country, because it was economically less developed, because it was less industrialized, because it had less railroads, etc., it would take the Russians six weeks to mobilize their army. And it was that four-week gap between mobilization of the French army and the mobilization of the Russian army that the Germans felt there was a window of opportunity for them, according to the Schleif, in fact. So the idea was that um, as soon as the German army was mobilized, it would attack France first. That essentially it could ignore Russia because it was going to take Russia longer to get its army together to mobilize to be prepared for war. So attack France first, defeat France quickly. And of course, the lessons of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 were that, yeah, the German army could defeat the French army very, very quickly. It had, I mean, the Franco-Prussian War lasted three or four months, but in reality, the French army was defeated in about three or four weeks. It was really only Paris that held out against the German or the Prussians. So defeat France quickly, then turn around and defeat the Russians single-handedly as well. The French, the Germans were very confident they could beat either the Russians or the French by themselves, and they didn't want to fight them at the same time. So in order to avoid that, the Schleifen plan called for attacking France first, then turning around and attacking Russia. Very simple. But now, as war looms in 1914, there was an obvious problem with the Schleifen plan. And that problem is the Russians are already mobilizing. That four-week window the German planners think they will have to defeat France and turn around and then defeat Russia is not going to work if the Germans simply stand around and allow Russia to mobilize first. Um, and that means, so, so this is where the German thinking comes from, that, well, if this war is going to be fought anyway, we basically want to use our Schleifen plan so with Russian, the German response is with the Russians mobilizing, we need to attack France. Um, so they declare war on France and Russia, but as per the terms of the Schleifen plan, attack France first um, and invade France by uh, invading Belgium and trying to attack France from there. So that's how our conflict in the Balkans potentially that had nothing to do with France, had nothing to do with Germany in reality, led to Germany invading France. We need to invade France now in order to ensure that we can defeat both France and Russia at the same time because we believe we're, going to, we're about to go to war with both of them anyway. So let us launch a preemptive strike. If you remember back to our lecture when we talked about the emergence of Belgium in 1830, we said that all the major powers of Europe had guaranteed Belgian independence by treaty. The Germans had obviously violated Belgian independence by invading Belgium to get at France. And if you're wondering why they attacked through Belgium, it was simply because the French-German border was much more heavily defended. The Belgian border was, was with France was not heavily defended, so it was easier for the German army to move through Belgium. The British had, by the Treaty of the Terms of London, the terms of the Treaty of London in 1830, agreed to support Belgian independence. And um, although that was really only the technical reason for given for British involvement. Uh, in, in the war of France, really the British were afraid that if Germany does defeat France and defeats Russia, which is very possible, um, then Britain would be left completely isolated again, so it felt it had no choice but to support France. So the Germans invade uh, Belgium on August 1st, 1914. The British declare war on Germany in August, on August 4th, 1914, and, and therefore have finally committed themselves to a military alliance with France and Russia against Germany. And the reaction around Europe, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in our next lecture, the reaction around Europe, at least in the early days, was one of general celebration. Um, that most of these countries felt that the other countries, their rivals, were the ones in the wrong. Many people felt this was finally a chance for the, be it the French, the Russians, the Germans, the Austrians, uh, the British, to you know put their enemies back in their box, to put them in their place. It was generally expected that the war, kind of like the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, would be relatively quick. Uh, the famous phrase is the war will be finished by Christmas. Um, and so a lot of people were hoping for kind of a quick, glorious war with a you know a dramatic victory. Um, and a, there was essentially a surge of nationalist and patriotic fervor as a result. Um, there was only a small number of people who realized because of technological change and innovation, because of the number of countries who were going to be involved, that this conflict was not going to be like the Franco-Prussian War. It was going to be something much bigger, uh, much longer, much more devastating. Uh, the British Secretary for State, 
um, in, 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 I guess in American terms, in the British, the British Foreign Secretary, in British terms, was a guy called Sir Edward Grey. Um, and on the British declaration of war in 1914, he declared the lights across you are going out across Europe. They will not be lit again in our lifetime. In other words, Grey understood this conflict is going to be horrendous um, and, and is going to be uh, long lasting. So war breaks out in August 1914 and we will examine our next lecture just how horrific that war ended up being.